like an iPad for mapping or like any of that. Also, they probably had to go every, like when they make a map, obviously, they probably had to go to like every location to actually know, whereas like we have, well, we have like that mapping thing, the sonar so that we can see and like we know something is there, whereas like they had no idea. They had to like actually go out and like search to add your map. The oldest maritime mappers, what they would do is they would take a very long rope and oh, yeah, tie yeah. knots at certain increments of known depths. And they just keep, put, they tie it to like an anvil or a rock and they just throw it overboard and see how far the line goes before it stops. So what were they trying to gain from that? Just seeing how deep it went? Yeah. Just out of curiosity? Yeah, and then for more coastal communities, it was a good way to assess your coastal communities for boats and crashes and whatnot. Because, you know, tides change. Some features that may be deep now may be shallow later. A boat might hit it. And you don't want to be hit by that boat, so it's better to be prepared and know your environment by, you know, making observations. Yeah. That That's the easy way, too and efficient for during that time. Very. And just like, they have such appreciation for trying to like understand their world. It's such a curiosity that's a little bit more rare today. And the opportunities have certainly shrunk with uh, increasing economics and whatnot. But that curiosity is still there for many scientists today but it's just presenting in different forms. And we just follow what we think is right and how we would think the world of science would benefit from it. That's wow. one of the, um, so um, in Hawaii, we have um, charter schools and immersion schools um, that really kind of focus in on teaching the students how to kilo. So kilo um, is a Hawaiian word for this very um, deep observational process. And so oftentimes the students would be taken out on the environment, whether it be at a lo'i palo, which is like our taro pond fields, um, where uh, taro is grown, which is a staple, um, so out good. to the loko ia, where fish ponds, um, just that deep observational process, you know, of using all of your senses, not just the visual, but all of the senses to kind of understand what's going on in your environment. And um, it just, it helps. I think children um, perhaps don't get those kind of opportunities to interact with their environment in those kind of ways. And so I've noticed, um, you know, just with the students that I've worked with, that there is a, a deeper focus. They're able to concentrate better um, when you're taught to do this kind of um, kilo and to observe the patterns and the trends, what's going on in your environment, what kind of wind is blowing from what direction, you know, what's flowering, what's spawning. So, you know, it's just this, this wonderful kind of knowledge base that can be gained by being still and being observant. Hmm. Yeah, the, again, the mentioning of patterns and cycles, it's crazy because there's so many cycles in science and especially in geology, like glacial warming, well, glacial periods and warming periods, they kind of oscillate back and forth and, you know, looking at how that affected, because like, Thinking about how our rocks were formed during the Cretaceous, um, the sea level was a, around 170 meters higher than it is now, and it even flooded the continents. And I constantly think if like looking at the Cretaceous can give a sense of what would happen in the future if mm. our ice sheets melted, uh -huh. would it also kind of have the same patterns as what happened during the Cretaceous? But I, I don't know. I, this is just some things that like I just think about sometimes. Uh -huh, and I'm uh -huh. like, what, what, can, what part of history could we look back on right now that is similar to what we are experiencing right now of like climate yeah. change and all that stuff? Well, that's so good because, you know, I think that's a really good lesson 
is to look back on history, mm -hmm. you know, because there are cycles, you know, and we understand yeah. that, then we're much more able to adapt to, you know, the current um, climate changes that are occurring. So I'm glad you're a geologist. Yeah. <laughs> I can look at those patterns. Yeah, no, there's so many different patterns in, in geology. It's, I'm, I'm sure there's patterns too in biology that I'm unaware of. <laughs> so but, many patterns. Yeah. So many patterns. And I think that's one of the fun things about history and geology and biology is like, at least for me, is learning the patterns and then understanding and trying to predict how it will influence the current uh, ecosystems that it, that it affects today. And again, it's another important thing to understand like what was happening during this time geologically, how these shipwrecks have influenced the environment, because there could be shipwrecks in the future. Uh -huh. So this is like just giving us more inside look on what could happen if another ship like this is found. Right. And then for the, the perspective of management of Kapahanaumokuakea, you know, what are some of the impacts to the ecosystems that the shipwrecks may be having um, and just understanding that. So this, I think this uh, dive has has really opened up a lot of questions, you know, for uh, us. Definitely for me. <laughs> yes, yep. And you know, that's the beauty of exploration, right? Mm -hmm. We're learning new things um, and hopefully answering some questions, you know, those burning questions that we have. Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to be shifting over to the next crew who will be taking over watch. It's been a pleasure to be with yeah. all of you. Thank you all. Uh, Malamopono, take care, and uh, we'll see you once again. Ahui ho. Bye. See you guys. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Uh, 8 to 12 watch is starting to trickle in, and uh, we're going to monitor the uh, ascent.
<laughs> huh? No. I don't want you up here. We gotta we gotta get Herc ready to to uh, swap out fuses. That's what we need to do. Um Yeah, I don't want it to get wet, though. What can we do? So, Bob, did I hear that we're uh, doing some stuff on the deck okay. once we start transiting? We could go wash it down. That would, yeah, really good around that bottle. We don't want it dripping when we go in there anyway. What's the plan here? We got another one? We're going to another one? Yeah, I believe we're heading to the... Uh, well, actually, I don't know. Uh, we're going to be doing some mapping, and then we're going to uh, be at another site um, okay. much later. I think it's a 13-hour uh, mapping transit planned. Oh, cool. wow. But uh, we'll keep an ear out um, just in case the schedule shifts at all. But Daniel will let us know. Okay. So they're all spread out that much, or is that... We're just mapping for a while. Uh, we're just mapping for a while. Okay. We're in secret squirrel mode. <laughs> <laughs> secret squirrel mode. I just put my headset on and I don't know what I just heard. <laughs> but I think it involves squirrels. <laughs> According to Robert, we're in secret squirrel mode. <laughs> ah, <laughs> perhaps we are.
So if anybody in the audience is just joining us, um, we just completed around 7 a.m. Uh, a survey of the uh, IJN Akagi, a Japanese uh, aircraft carrier that was sunk uh, shortly after the, the uh, Battle of Midway in June 1942. So um, it had been previously identified in 2019 uh, using side scan sonar and uh, tentatively uh, ID'd as the Akagi. Uh, we were able to confirm that with this dive uh, based on a number of structural features as well as uh, finding the name on the stern of the ship. Uh, right now we are ascending and preparing to uh, recover the, uh, uh, the ROV, um, tow sled Atalanta, in a few hours. And uh, after that we'll be doing a little bit of mapping and then uh, uh, once we've uh, completed that we will uh, be diving again probably probably about 16, 17-ish hours out. Um, my estimate is not very accurate on that, so don't hold me to it. But um, yeah, we had a uh, really lovely, very powerful dive uh, that we were all uh, part of over the last 20-ish hours. Mahalo, Dr. Val, for that. And yeah, those are the, you know, perfect words to explain what we've all experienced here on the Ala Omoana Kaiuli expedition. Uh, this was our second archaeological dive. Um, and thank you to all of the support, the scientists ashore, all of our partners. This was a great collaborative effort. Um, you know, that represents many nations, many entities many communities around the globe. So we're just so privileged to be able to bring all of this wonderful footage, these images um, from both the USS Yorktown and then the IJN Akagi. Thank you. So, Kukui, for uh, our first time viewers, do you want to let them know uh, what we're looking at here? <laughs> I want to say water <laughs> with some marine snow. Oh, fascinating. Are you, uh, are you capturing a lot of data at the moment? Is there... Um, uh, there's, there's 
there's plenty of data being captured on video right now. <laughs> I believe. Kukui, <clears throat> Kukui is our light, mm -hmm. our uh, our deep seated knowledge. Uh, she is uh, responsible for capturing all of the data that's logged during our dives on our watch, and uh, I'm glad I'm glad Kukui, you get a little bit of a break. Yeah. Um, we finally get uh, we finally get an ascent, and uh, you don't have to. Work so hard typing away. I'm sure Kukui's <laughs> fingers are typically ble bleeding and uh, <laughs> cramping up. It's uh, cramping yeah. up. It's a lot of work. So yeah, she's, she's been flying around that keyboard on these yeah. dives. I'm glad you get a little break, Kukui. Oh, yeah, we're a little bit below 3,150 meters and counting. So we were down at. Uh, 5,320 uh, or 30 ish for a while, a little below uh, 5,400 meters for uh, the duration of the dive. And we're coming back up. We'll be halfway home before we know it. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Little toe sled that could, huh? Robert's a little heavy on the winch. I just was just ripping, ripping it right up, Robert. <laughs> Within regulations. <laughs> Within regulations. <laughs> So there are scientists that look at our blue water footage, looking to see what kind of sedimentation we have. Yeah, and sometimes we get some interesting critters that show up in the water column during mm -hmm. ascents and descents. So. Yeah, there has been uh, some notes of you know, squid, a large squid school. I think after our first dive, or I think it was our first dive when we ascended, they saw like oh, a wow. large squid school. Wow. And. Yeah, you never know where you're gonna find in this blue water column. It's quite fascinating, honestly. I actually have a friend who um, studies the gelatinous um, zooplankton and pelagic, mm. you know, region. Um, she is very dedicated, and she just, you know, I think she does. She pays attention to locations like this, but then they go out and they actually collect samples of Great. some of these gelatinous organisms. Um, <clears throat> she's actually interested in the parasites that are within them, which is just oh. really, I mean, mind-boggling. Yes. Thing, things you can be interested in these days. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Oh, absolutely. oh, look, 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 look. Oh, my look. goodness. Speaking of. Oh, did everyone on the, that was, I mean, that might have been uh, extraterrestrial. I, that was, uh, that was a pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think you're right. It's not I'm, from <laughs> land. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting the looks. I'm getting you're the looks and the correct, control. Which and, is yeah. the best kind of correct, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Futurama. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, there's, look at this. That looks like a little pine. Swim. Yeah, a little right. shrimp. Yeah. So, yeah, the uh, the actual right. water column away from any substrate is pretty understudied, isn't it? The I'm sorry. I was looking at the definition of extraterrestrial. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> for, for further clarification. What, what were you asking? Uh, uh, what's going on in the actual water column away from any substrate is pretty pretty under understudied. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yes, it yeah. is. Um, it's it's one of the there are there are many research groups that are trying to um, conduct research in that area to learn more about this pelagic region. It's you know we know that it's so important because this is this is the pelagic space where one of the great migrations occurs. Um, there's the deal vertical migration. And so every day there are zooplankton and fish and, you know, the there's this vertical movement <clears throat> as the sun sets. Um, and so creatures from the deep come up to the shallows and feed on, you know, the shallow and then and then when the sun sets they come back down and, and that's such an important component of a lot of these like um, especially seamount communities, actually, there's a thought that that's mm -hmm. exceptionally important for them. And so, it, do we know how they sense uh, that diurnal cycle? Because uh, oh, we're, we're in waters where it just gets so dark. Well, I mean, there is still there's not visible light for us, but mm -hmm. there is still there is. Um, I mean, their eyes are adapted, and and I think a lot of it is light sensitivity. Um, I think there could also be other cues as well, like tides okay. or, you know, um, I haven't actually, I can't, I can't remember. I think someone also 
in shallower regions, I know the moon's really important as well. So okay. um, <clears throat> the the ability to sense light in this region is, is pretty, they're hypersensitive to it. Mm -hmm. Something that we'd never be able to see with how our eyes are adapted. Right, so even 1% or 10, you know, of light might be important yeah, in a slight change, you know. I think it's a really, um sort of powerful carbon sink as well, relevant yes. for climate change processes, this sort of vertical migration and, and uh, you know, the, the, the cycling of nutrients, but also the, the taking of uh, nutrients and especially carbon down to the seafloor, into the deep ocean. Um, you know, the, all those photosynthetic organisms that those deep organisms are feeding on during the day and are right. feeding on at night when they come up and then the, they can bring those back down into the muck or pelagic sediment or deep sea. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, it's incredibly important for the health of our planet and, and it is likely, I, w I would guess it's uh, understudied because uh, it's, it can be challenging to maintain, you know, it's not nearly as dramatic or as exciting as studying incredible shipwrecks or, you know, these sort of benthic organisms that are, uh, have a little bit more flair or you at least know where to find them most of the time. Right, yeah, here it's yeah. just chance encounters with, uh, with the cameras uh, as I, we're ascending or descending. I do love, uh, some of our viewers maybe have, uh, have done this, maybe some others in the van, but the, the black water diving experience, diving in deep water at night and mm. seeing uh, all kinds of interesting planktonic, different creatures migrating up in the water column and uh, it can be, uh, it does feel a little bit otherworldly actually. It feels like you're looking at uh, alien populations because there's uh, <laughs> oh, absolutely. such wild creatures. Some of those wild midwater creatures. organisms are so adapted to that lifestyle that they just look completely <laughs> foreign, like different to how even even from benthic organisms really it's yeah it's um it's something else yeah it's definitely something else and it, it's also really really very interesting to see the ways that different organisms adapt to such different areas because you know you still have this is kind of the interesting you still have arthropods right mm -hmm. um we've seen a few of those <clears throat> you still have nidarians um I'm trying to think, you know, but they're they're in very different forms, mm -hmm. right? Arthropods in the pelagic area are, you know, mycids and, well, I guess mycids look a lot like shrimp, but, um, you know, the amphipods and then the nidarians are jellyfish and um, so it is it is really interesting and and the fish themselves are. I think there's entire groups alone that are studying the, the fish in these areas. Oh, I believe Amazing. it. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I did see on a recent uh, blackwater dive, <clears throat> and I didn't even know that this was a thing, but there was a pelagic seahorse. So there was a seahorse really? that, that must spend most of its life in the sort of uh, midwater uh, and then come up to the surface at night. We'll have to... Wow. You know, verify this. Uh, don't even trust. Just verify. <laughs> but uh, but I do know I saw a seahorse out in the deep water, and which That's I amazing. always associated with sort of shallow water ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was uh, I was thrilled to see it. Um, and again, like most of those black water dives, it feels like uh, I'm hallucinating. So um, I could have could have just made it up. But no, uh, the, it's, um, there are photographs of hippocampus fisheri, and now I have to Google. That oh yeah, that's the first species. hit you got. Species. Yeah. Cool. Glad I could introduce our biologist to a, oh, uh, to a new and friend. And it's actually got a Wikipedia page. Yay. It's commonly known as Fisher's Seahorse. That's interesting. Yeah, this is why we all come together. There's always something new to learn and every there's day. A, yeah, there's a pelagic pygmy seahorse. This is interesting. Oh. The ocean is full of surprises, so internet, sure stay is. tuned. We don't know what might decide to show itself today. Dun, dun, dun. Very true. Oh, we are we are inching closer to halfway home from our depth of uh, 5,300, almost 5,400 meters. It's just a couple hundred meters till we're halfway up. We're running out of time. Uh, you guys better take advantage. Fill the banter, the banter <laughs> space now. Yeah, because after this, uh, you know, 
I'm going to go down to the lab and probably go work on some rocks. Um, <laughs> as long as I'm not going to make too much noise for the uh, deck crew. But oh, oh, what do we whoa, have there? Whoa. Is that a tinafor? Oh, wow. wow. That is, that that is fascinating. Tinafor. Wow. And it's wow. gone. <laughs> That was we, a big one. We love you, Tina, for nice. For nice Sebastian, work. we gotta tell him. I know. Yeah. No, he's gonna be jealous. Oh, <laughs> poor Sebastian. Yeah, this is why we stay tuned. This is why we love blue water. This is it. Sometimes we get little gifts like that. Yeah, little surprises along the way that Kanaloa gives us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Kanaloa is known, the Hawaiian uh, Akua deity of the ocean, um, of the deep ocean, of pole, of darkness, of both um, the womb and of uh, after afterlife, uh, is known to be a slippery character. One of his kinola, one of his favorite forms is a squid or an octopus, the he'e. And uh, so, so appropriate that, uh, you know, Kanaloa reveals himself to us in just glimpses, just instances, and constantly shif shape-shifting, changing forms. Uh, never know how he's going to show up, so uh, it's one of the things that makes the ocean so much fun. Mm -hmm. yeah, speaking speaking of, of being sneaky, I wonder if he showed up the other day. I called some, some people out. I told them, I was like, you guys got to come see. There's a group of little mahi, what look like mahi, kind of hanging out right next to the to the boat and they ran out. I've been looking at them for like half an hour. And I go <laughs> get them, we come out and they're not there. But oh I'm like, no. wait guys, just wait guys, they're gonna come. And sure enough, like five minutes later, they showed up and it was, okay. cool. it was pretty cool. That's Aww. pretty cool. It's beautiful. Those are incredible fish. Beautiful. So many of our pelagic species are just mm -hmm. iconic looking. So such powerful creatures traveling such long distances and adapted to these open ocean environments, they mm -hmm. remind me of our voyaging ancestors in a lot of ways and fed fed many of our voyaging ancestors as well. So always, always thankful. Remember we caught the that mahi, Uncle Bruce and Uncle Gary caught that mahi on the way back from Maui, yeah? Mm -hmm. And we're passing yeah. north of Molokai and in the Kaivi Channel. Yeah. Handlining a, a pretty good size mahi mahi. Uh, handlining. And, yeah. That's awesome. uh, and then letting the crew take it home. That was a, uh -huh. that was a big win. Wow. Cut it up and everyone got a bag. Yeah, it was <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I gotta say, this morning we were greeted with a beautiful sunrise. Mm -hmm. The weather, as well as the ocean in Kanaloa, have been very kind to us the last few days. It is insanely calm out here. I just, uh, okay, you do get these glassy conditions, of course, everywhere in the world, but uh, so, so lucky for us. Uh, the dives that we've been doing on these wrecks at these depths would not have been at all possible. We were already just right at the edge, so, mm -hmm. so thankful for that, for that window. Yeah, and in this part of Papahanaumokuakea, uh, the weather can be pretty intense sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a wide open exposure to, uh, to both the Southern Pacific and the Northern Pacific, which this time of year in September, you're kind of rolling the dice. You, you could mm -hmm. have highly active low pressure systems on in either side of the equator. And it just so happens that you can also, for the purposes of diving, you can have this uh, incredibly Nice, calm, malie conditions mm -hmm. that uh, barely feel the rocking of the ship at times. It's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit strange, actually. Yeah. Wake up and you're like, it's so calm. Okay, you guys, I have a poem for the fallen. Oh boy. I know this. It. You know, I was speaking downstairs with one of our other crewmates and. I think like this, these dives have a lot of komaha and there's like heaviness that comes with uh, some of the expedition dives that we've been doing over the past, you know, 24 plus hours. Um, but this is called For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion. They shall grow not old as, as we that are left grow old Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. And with that being said, um, you know, as we think of the own, our own veterans in our own lives, um, my great uncle, 
Captain Nando Cavallari uh, was born in January 1921, and he passed away, unfortunately, over Berlin, Germany. And this was a part um, of his memorial. And it says, God holds your loving arms about him. Keep him in your tender care. Please make up all that he had to suffer and everything that was unfair. He little thought when leaving us, he would return no more, that he and death soon would sleep and leave us here to mourn. We do not know what pains he bore. We did not see him die. We only know he passed away and could not say goodbye. And in our last watch, it was brought up that one of the younger crew members that served on the Akagi was just uh, 15 years old and he hadn't reached his 16th birthday before um, sacrificing on board his life for his country. And today I feel is is a very um, heavy day for many of the people across the states um, because it's also a day that we remember uh, those lost at Ground Zero. It's September 11th. So we could just share a moment of silence. Mahalo Mahina, Mahalo Nui. Inviting us to process the weight of today and of life. And that way, in this beautiful blue water in the ocean, been an intense, uh, intense few days. So, mm -hmm. uh, it has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mahalo Dan and Mahino for guiding us through these these very heavy times as well. Mm -hmm. So mahalo. 
As heavy as it is on my heart um, to navigate, you know, these uncharted waters or these moments with each of you on board and even our shore support, um, despite all of that, I still have great hope. You know, I have great hope in us as a species. I have great hope in us as a Lahui, as nations, as, you know, we collaborate on these efforts through exploration. I think we're able to find more intention in how we connect, learn, and grow together. And so although we have these very traumatic pieces of our history or parts of our history, I think the good outweighs the bad. Mahalo for sharing that beautiful, beautiful words of hope and connection. I Still so many reasons to laugh, to smile, mm -hmm. for Paina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to celebrate with one another. Mm -hmm. Ew. Absolutely. I think as we celebrate celebrate lives, as we celebrate these these moments, these connections, I think it also brings honor for those who, who gave so much, mm -hmm. who gave everything. Yeah. And also closure to the families mm -hmm. who have a connection to these ships. Exactly. Absolutely. There was sacrifice, but there was also great service, and it is our our duty to respect and honor that and celebrate that. Mm -hmm. I think it came up during our watch, uh, one of our watches, when we were uh, surveying uh, the USS Yorktown. That these were these ships were also places where people lived mm -hmm. and celebrated birthdays, all sorts of. Uh, all sorts of good things, promotions, yeah, um, yeah, just being with their crew. So th these are uh, historic sites and grave sites, and mm -hmm. it's a very sacred place, but they were also places with many moments of joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Guaranteed those sailors told too many jokes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably too many dirty jokes. <laughs> We won't repeat those. Without here. a doubt. We won't repeat those. <laughs> uh. You get really close to the people you're you're on a boat with at sea with, so they had an incredible friendship, mm -hmm. brotherhood, sisterhood, through service and through laughter. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing that. Uh, you know, we all get to experience here on the Nautilus too. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very close knit uh, ship and crew. The Hawaiians, I think, understood that as a foundation for for what sustainability looked like and what resilience looked like in the face of the kinds of challenges that the ocean presents you with. You know, it really does it does demand that you kind of come together and. Mm -hmm. You laugh together, you cry together, you, you go through everything together and, and sacrifice for one another. And they translated that same philosophy, that sort of va'a, ocean mentality, that uh, voyaging mentality on, back onto land in their communities. And uh, I think that's it's a, good, uh, it's a good message, a good concept for, uh, for the world to meditate on. We're on island earth, you know, we, we uh, we will go through hard times together. We will, we will go through struggles together, and we will go through great moments together. That that all of those bond us together as as a community, as a global community, even. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, being in these sacred waters and and visiting these sites and seeing all of the life, uh, the abundance of life that we've witnessed in in just a couple of dives on the seamounts mm -hmm. here in Papahanaumokuakea and. And even signs of life on on board the ship and here in the in the deep ocean, as as uh, small glimmers of Kanaloa and life, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, are sprinkled across the screen as mm -hmm. as we as we come back 
back to light, back to the ship. We can just uh, just remember, just remember that we are part of that. It's so serious. It sounds almost kind of cliche to talk about, but it's. Uh, I think the more that we are intentional, as you said, Mahina, and the more that we look at one another with with aloha and uh, and recognize how connected we are, how much we share. Uh, this entire planet that we share, this this ocean ocean planet that we have, is mm -hmm. wow, just in, just incredible, mm -hmm. uh, just incredible. Makes me want to party. Let's go. <laughs> Ship party. All Tra right. Transit party. <laughs> Monkey dick. We'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> We have uh, incredible crew on board with uh, many different traditions from around the world. We have some of our ship's crew from Honduras mm -hmm. and they uh, from Uvita. If you know the Caribbean, beautiful Bay Island beach party town, incredible, uh, incredible waters of their own, Kanaloa thriving mm -hmm. in that place. And uh, they're celebrating their Independence Day on Friday of this week. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, to just uh, having a good time, maybe even breaking out some dance moves. We're, tr we're trying to talk Catalina into uh, <laughs> sharing a little bit of her Please. Colombian and Cali heritage, uh, mm -hmm. the salsa capital of the world. It's where salsa, salsa dancing came from. So all you salsa lovers out there, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got Catalina on board and we might put her salsa skills to the test, see if she can teach us some moves. Uh, we'll see, I don't know. She hasn't fully agreed to that yet. <laughs> Help to put together a curriculum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we uh, at my level I need to start at worksheets, so please multiple choice actually. So, uh, Me too. <laughs> Scientists are some of the I won't say best, but some of the funniest dancers in the world as a category of dancers. Sci scientists are you know, you're are not awesome. wrong. They're awesome to watch dance. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny you say that. I was uh, I was sailing just this past year on an, a German ship, and um, and things are, are quite different on you know ships that you know international ships. Uh, and so at the very end of the month long cruise, they had a big party, um, alcohol involved. And I mean, the, I mean, a lot of these scientists were so serious by day, <laughs> and to see them transform was the funniest <laughs> thing. So I loved it. They had such a that. good time. And yes, they were very funny to watch. That is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. I will say, I, I, save, I save my best dance moves, which are still probably not that much, for when, for when I'm in the clean room by myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, too. That's okay, too. It's, it's, and there's uh, usually a Tyvek uh, uh, bunny suit involved too, oh, which wow. makes it even better. The secrets are coming out. I love it. Hey, this I is this it. is how you roll in an isotope lab. In, in an isotope Sometimes you're in there all day with very few breaks, and uh, you know you keep yourself entertained while you're waiting for some of the slower steps you're running uh, as much as you can. <laughs> Got to rock it out. It. Yep. Got to rock it out. And I can't just stay sitting for long periods of time. That uh, that gets a little. Uh, that, that, that just makes me get sore, so <laughs> gotta keep moving. <laughs> Having a good time is in our DNA. I don't mm -hmm. care what anybody says. It might be the fundamental gene, the original, <laughs> the original genetic information. You're probably right. <laughs> Have a good time. Yeah. Have a good time, Gene. <laughs> Put that in the science books. Dan, <laughs> Dan Kinzer. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm better at making music, at least used to be, than uh, <laughs> dancing to it. Oh, Soul Sister Val's coming <laughs> out. Where's the trombone? Go get it. I gotta get back into practice. It's been a few years. Oh. That makes me happy just thinking about it. I can't imagine actually getting to watch and hear you play. That would just yeah. might blow my mind. <laughs> I 
I don't think the crew would appreciate having a trombone aboard the Nautilus. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite as gentle and sweet as a ukulele, but... Uh, yeah, it hey. can get pretty loud if you <laughs> want it to. So It'd be like, Dr. Val, up to the monkey deck. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that would yeah. be a work deck. Uh, hey, yeah, I'm here for the marching band. Let's do it, the Nautilus marching band. Come on. Do a little high stepping during the uh, yeah. transit. Uh, we'll mapping. have a parade. We'll have a parade. There's not a not be a, a long march, wobbly. but it'll be a little wobbly parade. Yeah. Might uh, might go off note every now and then. <laughs> also, trombones are very long, and we have some narrow spaces to navigate. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just I'm probably overthinking right, this, but it's right. just like not the best ship instrument. Okay. Yeah. You're correct. Yeah, they're they're right. compact versions too. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, the mini trombone? I, I have actually a an alto trombone. Yeah. Um, don't get to play it very much, but uh, there are also what are called quote-unquote marching trombones, where instead of having to slide all the way out, it basically is folded in half and comes back to you. Oh. So it's it's made for more uh, compact stuff, and like marching in formation, so uh, you don't whack your neighbor in the head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Which I have inadvertently done before. <laughs> yeah, full, right. That a, was with a full size trombone. Ad, admit, admit it. Oh admit no, it, I was Val. I was that mortified because it was a very coordinated, <laughs> fast move, and I just like was a couple inches too short, and I hit one of my squad mates in the head, and I felt so bad. It was an act of retaliation. She, she though, was I'm she sure. was fine, but she was a little upset at me, and rightfully so. I, it was, I it was one of your volcanic moments, wasn't it, Val? No, <laughs> this this was pre-geology days. Pre-geology. <laughs> this is before I discovered that uh, geology was the thing that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. But I had a lot of fun with the marching band stuff. And, you know, I love music, so I'm, I'm at some point going to have to pick it back up because it leaves a little bit of hole in you when you put it down for a while. Sometimes you just need to go uh, bring that piece of yourself back again. Absolutely. Val, have you ever, um, have you by chance ever made it down to New Orleans for Mardi Gras? I have <gasps> not yet, but oh, I have some Mardi friends Gras down there, parades. and I want to try to do that one of these and, years. And I say that specifically for the marching bands. It's like one of my favorite parts of Mardi Gras. I mean, the marching bands yeah. in Louisiana are just top There are some incredible yeah. musicians oh, in Louisiana. Yeah. I, I, I love the New Orleans uh, jazz style. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, they when they march and they play, they're not only playing their music, but I mean, they dance, dance they twirl their, their instruments oh. around. It's just like the best show in the world. I love wow. it. Playing and dancing. Yeah. yeah. All right. At the same time, that takes some skill. Now we got to take Nautilus to Colombia and Honduras, <laughs> and then we'll hit up New Orleans. Yeah. And then where else? Where to next? We get all the best parties. Oh my We're going to hit yes. up all the best yeah. parties. <laughs> Nautilus party tour. Just kidding, Bob. Ballard, if you're listening, <laughs> we're not taking we, the we boat won't, up. We won't take Nautilus. We'll we'll uh, we'll find another vessel. Got to charter another vessel. <laughs> <laughs> take Hokulea. Yeah. Um, that might work. I don't know if the trombone would fit on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll make room. Make yeah. room. Oh man. Has Hokulea made it um, beyond the Pacific? Hokulea yeah. has, yeah. Okay. Mahina can probably talk more, but Worldwide Voyage was a was a voyage around the world, circumnavigated oh, wow. the planet by the stars, non-instrument oh, wow. navigation, sailed from Hawaii to Hawaii, yeah. uh, heading uh, heading west uh, through the Indo-Pacific and uh, South Pacific, Indo-Pacific, across the Indian Ocean, and mm -hmm. and uh, up through the Southern Atlantic Ocean into the Caribbean, and wow. all the way up. Uh, I think it did the, I forget the name of that uh, St. Lawrence River to Hudson mm -hmm. uh, sort of little transit that you can do, but the, the sort of great loop or something like that. But uh, did that and came back down through the canal, yeah. hit up the Galapagos so cool. and Rapa Nui. Yeah. Uh, amazing, amazing global expedition. That was yeah. 23, that was 10 years ago they, they set mm -hmm. out and came home in 2017. So. Well, what an incredible experience that must have been. Yeah, I, I mostly watched it from afar and just fascinated and, and got involved. Mo I got mostly involved uh, on what they call the Mahalo Hawaii sail, which was uh, just the, upon their return back to Hawaii, just um, you know, wanting to sail to every port in the islands to uh, thank the community, thank the kids, mm -hmm. um, thank everybody for their support um, that, that carried the canoe around the world. And mm -hmm. that was really special. But and the community always comes out 
in force to see the <laughs> Hokulea Oh, yeah. most definitely. It's such a big deal. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I too, I was not involved with the Worldwide Voyage. I was actually still in high school. Mahina, I would see, baby yeah, I would see all of the photos of Hokulea and then, you know, Tabletop Mountains, uh, Cape Town, oh, South wow. Africa. And I think there's so many iconic images and, you know, voyaging, I think life at sea in general is romanticized often. Um, people don't really <laughs> understand. I think like the vast majority, you know, my friends and family, they see when I sail or when I go out to sea, and they just think it's just all the glamour. And the sailing part is, you know, glamorous to the um, onshore eye. <laughs> but it's a lot of hard work. It really is, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of hard work. There's different challenges. It's rigorous, like mentally, physically. Um, you know, sailing deep sea voyages have really tested my own strength and stillness within me. And there are moments that are far from glamorous <laughs> and sure the are. ocean can become <laughs> rough and foul and yes. you know it's there are ugly moments and moments when you just want a hot shower and a, a completely <laughs> dry towel you want to wash your clothes in a, a washer like a washing machine instead of a five gallon bucket mm. and you run out of conditioner and all the little things but all in all i think there's a lot of great lessons there and the principles that we live by at sea, you know? Mm -hmm. I have very different uh, experience than what I'm familiar with working on research ships. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I feel you on the, on the hot shower thing because mm -hmm. after I've cut up enough rocks out on the work deck, I'm, I'm basically coated in my own manganese crust and Oh my gosh, you got to get that stuff cleaned up. <laughs> Manganese encrusted vel. It's a yep. whole different kind of geology, biology specimen. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of hard work, but it's it's well worth it. Well worth it, yeah. 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 All right, we're just under 2,200 meters depth and rising. For those, uh, for those new viewers, new to Nautilus Live or YouTube, this is where we typically see uh, the sea monsters. So uh, <laughs> don't take your eyes off the screen. You won't want to miss it. What kind of sea monsters? Are we talking like uh, headless chicken monster could class? Could be some or HCMs, could be. Cthulhu could be class. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, those are two very different ends of that spectrum though. Yeah. Very large mm -hmm. tuna forest. Yeah, yes. there's, the whole, there's the whole spectrum, yeah. Um, Those large tinophores are fascinating. Sharks. Like, okay, I don't know anything about them because this is well out of my area of expertise, but they're just so fascinating to look at. It's like, what are they? You know, <laughs> how do they work? Sticky cells, lots of yeah. sticky cells. Yeah, I mean, they're mostly gelatinous. They've got only like two layers of dermis, um, or not even dermis, it's um, mesoglia. And um, they have these, instead of nadarians, which have like really amazingly adapted meat assists, which are stinging cells, these have sticking cells. Oh. Um, <coughs> yes. And they also have teens, which are the, the portions of the, it, it's sort of the swimming portion of, of these tinafores, um, as well as draws. Um, draws food towards the mouth sometimes um, and that is what you see refracting or reflecting light and that's why they can look iridescent or mm -hmm. like have those rainbow shines and yeah we saw that a couple of dives ago with one that got right. really close to the camera yeah tinafores to my knowledge do not have um, uh, do not produce produce their own light but they're very good at like those those very small um, components that actually look like little squares just moving like hmm. um, moving in similar directions um, do reflect the light mm. do um, they have a centralized nervous system um you know other jellies that i'm aware of have nets um i wouldn't be surprised if they also have sort of a net uh, system it's I'm, I'm unsure right now there's been some work on jellies and and their nervous systems. I'm not certain if we 
categorize it as a, a tr like the nervous system that yeah i'm not certain if it's categorized as a true nervous system if it's categorized as like a net okay sensory system or what um but i do know that they're they do have some sense yeah, cause they, yeah. they'd have to in order to draw food into themselves but it's just mm -hmm. trying trying to get my head around you know how that stimulus response thing works in an animal that's very different from you know our perspectives right yes it's it's a really it's it's really fascinating the different ways that these different organisms um, take in inputs, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's very specialized to that that uh, niche in the ocean that they occupy. Absolutely, you know, and there are, there are multiple forms of tenophores. There are some that have the I think they're sometimes called gooseberries, but they're circular, and they have the several, like I think four tentacles coming down, and they're very beautiful and very, they're delicate looking. And then you've got the like low, low bottom Berea tenophores, which are just like a duck bill moving through the water somehow. Like it's just two sort of lobes that will just open up and um, they can be used for like moving quickly, but also for grabbing prey items as well. Those are predatory hmm. tenophores. It's wow. Um, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating how like how they they sense things. Like um, the nerve net um, often comprises of these nerve knots, ganglia, oh. which I think is um, pays a large tribute to how they can sense things or like sense certain things around them. I think. Yeah, so not a completely centralized nerve system like uh, mm -hmm. um, some of the more advanced phylums down the evolutionary chain, but as you go up through these phylums, starting from periphera, which doesn't have a nervous system, but you keep going up through these phylums to Cnidaria, to Tenophore, um, they have these more advanced nervous systems, um, which often starts with these nerve knots, I think. Interesting. I could be wrong, but... No, that's excellent. I didn't know that. Thanks, Kukui. Mahalo Our light. <laughs> yes. That's all you folks. <laughs> nice try, Kukui. <laughs> you got the name and you got the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Kukui is um, an incredible, an incredible plant, a uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian plant. I don't know. I, I, I think it's a native. It's not a canoe plant, right? It's a native plant to Hawaii. I think so. And uh, the kukui nut is uh, highly treasured and valued for both its medicinal uses mm -hmm. and the oil that could be burned to provide light. Yeah. And uh, that light is a symbol of knowledge mm -hmm. for Hawaiians. And uh, it's, a, it's a cherished, we'll often make uh, lei, beautiful lei mm -hmm. um, garlands to wear around our necks, especially Especially, it's a nice to give to kumu, to teachers, mm -hmm. or people who have bestowed significant knowledge or retained or received significant knowledge. And I wish I had a bunch of kukui to make a lei for kukui, because she, uh, <laughs> she definitely deserves it. Aww. Yeah, it's an absolute honor and gift to be able to learn from all of you folks over here on board and <laughs> on shore too. So, mahalo you guys. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. I just want to, uh, the messages are, are primarily for Mahina and thanks again to Mahina for sharing the poem and, and those reflections earlier on just moments in history um, and our, our deep personal connection to uh, to these moments uh, where significant lives, not just numbers of lives, but just pe these are these are significant lives because they matter to people's families, to to people's stories, to their communities, and um, when they're lost, I, I, th I can't help but but think of think of all of our ohana, all of our friends, um, our community in Lahaina, Maui as well, mm -hmm. and uh, just over a month ago suffered that terrible fire and. And uh, but yeah, a beautiful comments uh, coming from one of our viewers who's a member of the company of military military historians and also the U.S. Army veteran, and um, just going through and and uh, using using their gift to uh, uh, 
to bring to life uh, some of those, I'm sure, who were some of your great uncle's friends um, who passed in World War II above Berlin and, and also just remembering September 11th. And for so many people, you know, I was um, quite a bit older than Mahina. I was in college in, uh, on September 11th and I remember, uh, I can remember very vividly where I was when, when uh, I first came across the TV screen. Mm -hmm. And I know for many people, especially those with deep personal connections to that day, it's uh, something they, they live through and experience on a daily basis or a very regular basis. Um, so mahalo to, uh, mahalo to Mahina and, and to all of those out there for, for honoring and remembering those really significant lives. All lives are, are mm -hmm. so significant and um, I appreciate that. All life is sacred. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> Blue water is fun. Such a mix of uh, profound moments of learning <laughs> and reflection with you all, and uh, in in the depths as we as we come back into the light. Mm -hmm. And also just uh, such a great time for silliness and, uh, yeah. and laughter and jokes and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, planning our, our global party uh, <laughs> marching band parade around the world <laughs> by sea um, through all the great dancing cultures. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that have a good time, Jean. Uh, I don't know which came first, that one or the love your family and your community, mm -hmm. Jean. <laughs> but I think it had to be a close race mm -hmm. for the start of life. Most definitely. To, uh, yeah, and as some of us were talking to our fellow crewmates who are from Honduras, um, just hearing their own stories about their own families, how they miss their children, their wives, um, and then you know, missing a, a holiday that's so important to them, their Independence Day that's coming up on this Friday. And they looked so relieved and, you know, astonished when we were told them that we wanted to participate and do something to celebrate uh, their people, their culture, their nation. So we are in the, the planning mist to <laughs> celebrate a wonderful Honduras uh, Independence Day with our fellow friends, um, on board just so they feel closer to home so they feel closer to their families uh, some of them have longer contracts and they'll be here on board for another few months some until the holidays until december and you know we were talking to ronald yesterday and he has you know, two beautiful daughters and a young a younger son and he was just saying that being at sea you know he's able to to do all these things, to provide all of these things in a wonderful quality of life for his ohana, his family. But at the same time, he said that he misses everything. He misses the first steps of his five-month-year-old son. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, the first chuckle of his son, his daughter's first day at school. Like these are moments that, you know, this is his sacrifice being here. And so if we can make him feel more at home with us, celebrated and loved on board, then I see that as our kuleana, as our responsibility to take care of one another, to help one another. Absolutely. Certainly, yeah. Looking forward to it. And that reminds me of the beautiful Lolono Eo you shared a couple of days ago, Kokua Kukua Mai Talono Kanohono Ohana. That is the lifestyle of family, and it truly is a whole family here on board mm -hmm. when you're out here at sea. So, mahalo nui mahina for um, that mana'o. My, um, my son's ninth birthday is on, on Saturday, day after Honduran Independence, so you're all invited to... Uh, you know, thanks to the gift of telepresence on board, mm -hmm. I'll be able to uh, stay connected with, with uh, my son on his birthday. Yes. And I wonder too if we, uh, I don't know, I don't, it'd, be, it'd be cool to see if uh, different parts of the world have different access to these kinds of technologies, of course. So, but how cool if, uh, mm -hmm. if uh, some of our crewmates were able to actually utilize that. I'm sure they do. Uh, we have pretty good Wi-Fi. It's pretty amazing <laughs> how connected we are given how, how remote Mm -hmm. how remote we are but uh, 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, the parents will, will sacrifice so much for their children and, and vice versa. Family is so important to all of us and we all have chosen family. We all have the family that we didn't choose, uh, that we learn to, that we at least try and hopefully or learn to love uh, despite uh, our differences sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, you know, family is kind of the fundamental unit, however we want to define that and however we, you know, we carry that. It's uh, the people we hold close to us. We, we depend on them. Our lives yeah. depend on them. We can't so. do everything ourselves. You yeah. know, we're, we're, intrinsically social animals mm -hmm. and uh, yeah we need that yeah. keeps us grounded separate note but uh, our, our friend Jorge from Utila in Honduras mm -hmm. I, I highly recommend googling it you'll immediately want to go um, do an image when you do an image search of Utila it's uh, what a beautiful beautiful I'm watching place. you scroll through this on my monitor over here and it's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> Standing. I just sent a message to um, the mom of my best friend, who's kind of like a second mom to me. She's mm -hmm. Honduran. Mm -hmm. So I said, do you have any suggestions for good music or anything oh, else? Yes. I said, I don't have control over the food because I know they have a lot of great food. But mm -hmm. yeah, she's sending me some song recommendations. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Hello, thank Getting you. Getting us hooked yeah. up. Yeah, yes. Catalina, we call that, I I have one of my my dear friends, I consider her a sister. But I, that's what we call a Hanai mom, like an Aww. adopted mom. Yes. That's yes. your Hanai yeah, totally. mom. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And sometimes I call her my fairy godmother. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Everyone needs at least one good Hanai mama, yeah? yeah. Sure do, yeah. Sure. yeah. We have them, we all have them. Yeah, that's a lot how it worked uh, when I was at grad school at University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you pretty much immediately get accepted into the grad student cohort and they become mm -hmm. Hanai. Mm -hmm. It's it's amazing because a lot of us, you know, there, there are a lot of folks who are local to the islands who attend. Mm -hmm. Then there are a lot of us who come in from other parts of the world and we're so far away from uh, everything else that um, you, you end up uh, uh, kind of getting rooted into mm -hmm. uh, the Ohana here. And it's... Absolutely. It's 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 so accepting and you know just very close knit and yeah I still talk to a number of those people to this day and I'm pretty sure we're gonna stay in touch for the rest of our lives. Oh, it's guaranteed. Yeah, the the practice of Hanai is a very real living practice, uh, the ancient practice of the Hawaiians to keep the community integrated. It was quite common for um, children to be raised by mm -hmm. aunties and uncles who would Hanai them into the family and. Uh, you know, it's that old sort of adage of it takes a village to raise a child was very mm -hmm. much practiced and true in, in Hawaiian culture. And it kept Ohana's linked and communities, um, you know, reminded of, of the importance of caring for one another. That word hanai and maybe kukui or mahina could mm -hmm. go into more depth, but uh, kind of associated with the word hanao, same mm -hmm. same word in papa hanao mokuakea, which means to, to, uh, to be born. Uh, to be born into and Hanai in, in some way is to be to be brought into um, into that relationship so I don't know yeah. all the specific meanings in Kona I'm not my Olelo Hawaii is uh, is in an infant stage but uh, mm -hmm. but yeah really really beautiful concept and beautiful word yeah and even when we've moved away uh, after graduating to, you know move on to new jobs new parts of life new chapters we still stay in touch, and uh, if you're if you're in if you end up traveling to an area where uh, one of these folks are, you know you've got a friend in town that you can uh, call on if you need it. Mm -hmm.
Did everyone see the incredible images of the uh, of the paddle out in Lahaina last Friday? Yeah, right before no, the weekend. It was a spectacular, spectacular event. Hundreds and hundreds of people came out and and brought out their their va'a, their canoes, their uh, their boats, brought out their uh, surfboards um, of all kinds and uh, joined together um, just off the shores of Lahaina uh, to commemorate one month from the fire. Uh, will be remembered, I think, as the 8-8 fire, the August 8th fire. And uh, just to show their solidarity with the community and the fact that that community is still there, still thriving, um, uh, despite also the pain, you know. And I, I've been thinking a lot about our, our family and our friends, our ohana uh, in Lahaina. Uh, as we've been on these wrecks, that same sort of tension in my heart, that same sort of hope for the future, um, but also that heaviness um, has been there for, for that community. And so thankful for the leadership, um, the folks who are helping them navigate and captaining them through, um, just our local heroes, um, Hawaiian heroes over there in the Haina. And just want to mahalo all of them and, and lift them up as we come back to the light, come back to the surface. In this far end of Papahana Mokuakea, the foundational, you know, Wawakua, Aina Akua, and Kopuna, just acknowledging that uh, we ask for their protection, we ask for their, you know, to to uh, surround them with their aloha um, in Maui, mm -hmm. such a such a sacred place there, and uh, I think uh, that that history, this fire, in a lot of ways, is is helping us remember the history of that place, which is uh, mm -hmm. remarkable, incredible in its own right, and. And yeah, because Lahaina has such a long story to it, a it long does. history. Yeah. It does, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, we are working on some uh, winch adjustments as we bring up tow sled at Atlanta. Mahalo nui dan for noko pai pai ana kilama na o, and yeah, it was Lahaina was a home to, and is still a home to so many significant resources and for the people. And you know, the day the day after it happened, I I was at work, and I was overhearing a workshop that um, some of our colleagues were attending um, about archaeological resources. And um, I, I feel like this doesn't only apply to archaeological resources, but what I heard within that workshop is that through the Mo'olelo, through telling these stories of these people and of these places and of these homes, that is how they live on. That is a big part and how they live on. So I just want to mahalo you guys for bringing that into the conversation and for um, keeping that, uh, that, that air, that air flowing. Um, I feel like it's a big part to uplifting communities we're in need. So mahalo nui. Mahalo kukui. Kukui, uh, ho Maui is home for kukui and so we know your heart is there in that aina and, and with those people and we, we're glad they have young hamas like you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For those listening who don't know that hamas is a very, is very complimentary so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. from hamos like you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how to finish your plate, maybe, yeah. There you go. Good, at, good, at, good at teaching that lesson. <laughs>
for those who uh, love the winch. Sorry, but you're missing out. I'm getting a great <laughs> lesson, listening in on the team uh, talk about uh, talk about how to handle handle the winch, bringing this ROV Atalanta back up from so deep. That's a lot of cable. It's a lot of line to uh, to spool back on board the ship. I know I learned on the Yorktown dive just how much people love. Yes. The school and yes. love and love the winch. Cams. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, winch it's Yeah, a, right now they're just making sure that it's spooling uh, in the right spot. Yeah. Because uh, we uh, we want to make sure that the uh, cable is kept as safe as possible. So that cable is vital technology. It carries all of our power and electricity um, mm -hmm. down to the vessels and brings all of the data. All of that video uh, streaming data, sensor data comes uh, streaming back up through our fiber optics inside that cable. So this cable uh, that's hauling these ROVs up is a is a critical piece of, yeah, it of has technology. Multiple jobs. Multiple mm -hmm. jobs. So not just data, but without that, we couldn't recover the tow sled because it's not uh, it, it's not neutrally or slightly positively buoyant like uh, Hercules and Little Heart her car. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a hanging weight. <laughs> just a hanging it's weight. It's a, what is it? What were they saying last night? Like a meatball on the end of a <laughs> spaghetti noodle? We had a lot of uh, analogies, some of them uh, uh, pretty adept, others uh, maybe in need of, <laughs> of some workshopping. We, I don't know if we have any, uh, we have any literary teachers on board. It's mostly scientists, archaeologists, <laughs> but... Uh, Mahina is a bit of a poet, so no. <laughs> might uh, might ask for your help, Mahina, in workshopping our metaphors. <laughs> After Catalina does a salsa workshop. <laughs> Is both of you, please, just multiple choice. That's all I can. That's all I can handle. Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That's stretching it. <laughs> So I felt like uh, on last night's watch, one of the truly incredible moments that we had from this dive was when we got to the stern mm -hmm. of the Akagi and we could see its name. Mm. Uh, and it took us a little while to uh, uh, confirm it because uh, the, the characters had been painted over uh, in order to uh, make it harder to identify. But um, the, the pilots and uh, uh, Amber, our video uh, technician, uh, worked together in order to give us just the right lighting that we could identify uh, the embossed characters. Like we could uh, see the relief of them uh, underneath the paint. And uh, we were able, along with some help from some of our Japanese colleagues, uh, uh, translate those, those characters and confirm that it was Akagi. Yeah, that was a highlight to me. For me, definitely, Val. Um, just incredible to have a ship that's been uh, so deep for mm -hmm. so long, face such tremendous battle, to reveal its name to us, even though it was mm -hmm. uh, wasn't going to give it away so so easily. We were going to make yeah. us work for it, but I thought that was appropriate and um, just a great way to honor honor the ship. Really cool, even small things. Just you know, be a reminder that. You re read Japanese from right to left instead of left mm -hmm. to right, and these mm -hmm. are subtle differences that that uh, make each culture so unique and um, and special. And yeah, I definitely was glad was glad that we were able to uh, catch that that glimpse um, on the stern just as we came around the starboard side. That was yeah. a little bit haunting to have the mm -hmm. those characters reveal themselves just very mm -hmm. subtly through the paint, but. Uh, yeah, pretty spectacular moment. I, I I tried to remember to cut that highlight clip. I was like, oh, <laughs> hopefully I got it right. I'm not quite as good. At no, we'll we'll find it. Hitting those highlights as Kukui, but <laughs> as, as long as it's marked close to the timestamp, uh, <laughs> yeah, the team will be able to find it. Yeah. Yeah, and what uh, 
Mike was telling us last night is uh, it's it's not it, it's not in, super common uh, for ships to reveal their names to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this right. was kind of an incredible moment. Indeed. We have a viewer asking about the dimensions of our of our cable, um, the diameter of the cable connecting us to Atlanta. Um, I'm guessing it's about an inch, but I don't know the specific. Uh, that's just an eyeball. Um, might might be a little bit thicker than that. I don't think I want to do that conversion. <laughs> <laughs> it would be it would be a very very skinny noodle. Yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah. If you scaled it down to, uh, well, yeah, if you scaled the cable down, it would probably be much, much thinner than a human hair. Yeah. I can't give a more exact number than that. Yeah, the actual actual diameter, I think, somewhere somewhere close to an inch. We can see if we can. I can find that, but uh, very strong, very strong cable. Obviously, has to be able to hold not only the weight of the ROV but also its own weight as it uh, extends down from the A-frame. And, um, and so incredible amount of tension that uh, we're monitoring very closely uh, leading up to and uh, during, throughout the dive, uh, making sure that that, tent, that that cable is gonna be safe, we're not gonna damage it. So it was, uh, that's, could see that the whole crew, but especially our expedition leaders, Daniel and Megan just, uh, not taking their eye off that those readings uh, from A-frame acceleration uh, for very long and, or uh, projected tension, cable tension for very long. That was, <laughs> that was my mom who asked that question about the, uh, oh, the noodle. Well, nice. <laughs> mom, Val's mom, one of our favorite online viewers. We're mm -hmm. so glad you're here and so glad that you've uh, raised such a fine human being and uh, sent Val on this awesome uh, lifelong expedition. Uh, love affair with with rocks, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, we're learning so much from Val. So grateful for you. So on one of the screens in the control room, uh, not, uh, I can see it's, uh, it's giving us a view from the monkey deck, and it looks so beautiful outside right now. The sun's shining, the seas are calm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredibly calm. Yeah, I think on the quad cam, actually, if you look at uh, camera number three, if you're viewing online, you'll see off the back deck not off the bow, but uh, you can still get a sense. A lot of times you'll see uh, the ocean just toggling, uh, you know, left and right, uh, the horizon. Um, and here there's just a very slight lean today. Uh, as, and I think we're headed for even calmer seas over the next couple of days, which is hard to believe. Knock um, on wood. But uh, yeah, I don't want to kind of law ignore that. I didn't say anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a... Uh, Amazing to think we're on this end, and, and I don't know if people saw the news, but Kilauea, you'd be excited. Uh, Kilauea yes. has experienced a major new eruption yeah. um, or so. increase in, in uh, volcanic activity. But uh, Yeah, I got this email middle of the afternoon, uh, uh, Honolulu time, um, from the uh, USGS Hawaiian Volcanoes Observatory. I'm, I'm on the, uh, the USGS's mailing list for uh, volcano you. updates. <laughs> of course you are. Yes, they're, they're relevant. And yeah, we got a notification that um, they detected unre uh, increased unrest at, in the uh, summit caldera system, uh, including some shallow deformation and uh, seismicity. And then a little under half an hour later, uh, they sent out another uh, uh, another email confirming that um, it had begun erupting, and I saw some pictures yesterday uh, showing that <clears throat> it looks like uh, there's a, a little bit of fountaining, some low fountaining uh, occurring on one side of the Halimau'u'u lava lake within Kilauea caldera, and it looks like 
you know, it's, it's hard for me to tell from the pictures exactly, but it seems like there is a little bit of a fissure that opened up slightly outside of uh, Halima'u Ma'u and into the uh, floor of the caldera one of, in one of the down-dropped blocks. I saw what so looked like that new fissure as well as a new yeah. development, yeah. And it, uh, it's a little bit different from the last couple of eruptions that uh, uh, Kilauea has uh, uh, had earlier in the year. You know, pre pretty similar kind of timeline from increased shallow unrest to eruption, more or less. But uh, opening up that new fissure is a, is a little bit different this time. It's but exciting. Pele's, Pele's on the move. But, uh, yeah, Pele's moving around. But uh, uh, the eruption is contained within the caldera system. Um, th there's uh, uh, no immediate danger to any communities uh, on the rift systems. And we just got an update uh, a little a little earlier this morning from Hawaiian Volcanoes Observatory that uh, they're lowering the uh, aviation code down because uh, there's there's not really any uh, high risk of uh, uh, like any sort of uh, ash clouds being ejected into yeah. the atmosphere like there was with the 2018 eruption. So this is another one of those uh, very very typically gentle yeah. uh, Kilauea eruptions. Yeah, it's incredible how close um, we're able to get. When I was able to take my my children over to Mokokeave in, in uh, early December after Mauna Loa started erupting last year mm -hmm. again, first time in uh, I think close first to time forty in my years. Lifetime. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think I was just a very young child the uh, last time it had erupted, and and uh, just such a sacred, another sacred realm. I mm -hmm. hope one day my, my children can travel into this realm as well and, and visit mm -hmm. Papa Hanamokua Keo, but incredible to see uh, the Akua in action. Kanaloa, yeah. Pele, it's always uh, Kane, it's always Lono, it's always exciting mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, and just a great reminder that we live in this dynamic earth that mm -hmm. is, uh, that is constantly evolving and changing, or it's not yeah. just in history, it's, it's alive right now. and. And uh, such a, I so remember, lucky. I remember visiting uh, the Kilauea summit for the first time uh, after, uh, since the uh, uh, 2018 eruption, because I'd been up there a couple times prior. And the, the summit system is just so, so starkly different. Yeah. Yeah, changing uh, all because the Because of the caldera collapse sequence that occurred during 2018 as, yeah, the, as uh, the volcano deflated and mm -hmm. uh, 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 the the whole morphology of the crater uh, responded to that uh, that deflationary trend. Uh, a lot of the, the magma came up into the summit caldera system and then moved into the lower east rift zone. That's right. So lots of dynamic changes on that volcano. Uh, it was incredible the changes happening on, uh, across that whole side of the island. Yeah, so many yeah. communities affected back in right. 2018 and 19. And uh, uh, it's uh, yeah, still it's amazing because even, even when those communities are affected and People are almost sitting in their living rooms as fissures are open, as little vents are opening up in their backyards. It's like, yeah, oh my that gosh. Was, that was scary. That was scary. I, I was, was still living in Honolulu when mm -hmm. that started. And, yeah. uh, you know, we were kind of keeping an eye on things. And just, you know, we had uh, members of our uh, science community at UH who were affected by uh, sure. what was happening at Leilani Estates. And yeah. so it was, it was very personal and... You know, we're, we're also invested in what the volcanoes are doing on the islands too that you know there wasn't much that we could do from yep. our position except you know try to try to provide whatever support we could mm -hmm. and if usgs um needed some help you know we had a uh, you know we, we were speaking with them uh but yeah usgs was running the show and they did a really good job with that but yeah you know, we were just trying to support in any way that we could uh during that Really, and it's try to uh, keep everybody as safe as possible. Yeah, it's really about observing and giving Pele her space. There's really not much, uh, not mm -hmm. much else that can be done, you know, besides uh, doing our best to understand. Very similar to interacting mm -hmm. with Kanaloa and being out here on the ocean. And amazing to think about Pele traveling this, this line all the way from out here where we are in Papahanaumokuakea, and and uh, now you know so active. Uh, Thousand, over a thousand miles away, so so far, you know. Yeah, uh, but we're uh, way out here. You know, and uh, as the plate's been shifting over this this hot spot, and and Pele's been giving birth to new islands, it's important to remember this geological story, this uh, Akua time frame, not just mm -hmm. uh, not just oh, our, our house is burning, <laughs> but it just is important and and always important to consider. But also that, you know, so many cultural mm -hmm. practitioners. Uh, 
you know, I just urge people to honor and respect those people on Moko Keawe, the Native Hawaiians, Kanako Evi, who are, will go and offer their whole kupu, will go and, and uh, communicate through protocol like, like Mahina has been guiding us through here in, in Papahana Moko Akea. It's, uh, it's just an opportunity to, to be reminded of, of just the, the true power of, of our planet and, and where we mm -hmm. live. So. And how to coexist with that. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. I think it's sometimes as it's so hard for us to fathom and comprehend all of the natural rhythms around us. Mm -hmm. um, as much research as we do, as much data as we collect, I mean, there are some parts of our, our natural world, our natural history, that just still leave us in awe, <laughs> still leave us questioning. Very much so. And there's a lot, you know, and, and you know, it, it might be a very human thing to want to feel like we have a sense of control over certain aspects of our planet, but we, we don't, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we've we contributed to a lot of things like, you know, um, uh, the, the, the climate change issue, but mm -hmm. when it comes to volcanoes, we cannot control those. They have a mind of their own. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Things we can influence, things we cannot. It's um, one of the great challenges I think that humanity faces is that uh, coming to the realization that despite all of our technological process and incredible scientific understanding that's been developed over not just the last few hundred years, but especially over the last few, you know, hundred mm -hmm. to few hundred years, uh, we are still not in control. It's, yes. <laughs> it's a difficult yeah. realization yeah. to come to. But, we're still and not we never will be. Never will be. Mm. Yeah. Never that's that's just be. something we have to be okay with. Yeah. yeah. So that's where the coexistence becomes such such a key uh, to 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 our survival, our ability to thrive. Absolutely. But you know, it's not just the last few hundred years, as you say, because there's so much indigenous knowledge too that touches on these principles with great depth. And uh, those go back thousands of years. Yeah. Don't have to. Don't have to tell me. That's for sure. I'm. Oh, uh, I know. I'm, I'm so. I know you're not. I'm I know saying it, Western science we're, is we're, still playing yeah. catch up a little it's, bit. It's incredible to recognize that there was uh, such a depth of knowledge, ecological knowledge, uh, you know, astronomical knowledge, earth science, ocean mm -hmm. science, all of these, just incredible knowledge. You know that allowed. Uh, Mahina, this whole legacy of voyaging that, that stretches back thousands of years is, is some of the is based on some of the greatest science I think that's ever been done, Most ever yeah. been known. Yeah. yeah, to a deeper level than than we might be able to achieve with with our current Western scientific methods. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's pretty uh, pretty remarkable. I, I love hearing stories of you know the science, the the knowledge acquired through through an, an older way of doing science. When we hear stories of people like Pius Piao Lug, mm -hmm. Papa Mao Piao Lug, who who uh, re-sparked, rekindled, brought back to life uh, the navigational traditions of the Pacific um, by teaching so many young Hawaiians at the time. Now now uh, teachers to us and, yes. and uncles to us, but uh, um, and across the Pacific, not just in Hawaii, and just uh, mm -hmm. think about. Uh, you know, the, the way they conducted science in this incredibly holistic way that it feels like here on board the Nautilus, we're, uh, we're beginning to invite some of that old way of doing science back into the conversation, into the practice, mm -hmm. combining it with cutting edge research and technology and tools. And it's uh, that integration, I think, uh, Malia Evans, who's on board with us, yes. gave us gave a remarkable talk on this in, back in March when we gathered in Rhode mm -hmm. Island, the, the expedition planning session. and. Oh, she uh, she was awesome. so good in that talk. Mm -hmm. Was outstanding, yeah. And yeah, that, that holistic approach mm -hmm. kind of benefits all aspects of uh, these kinds of studies. You know, if you just ensile yourself um, mm -hmm. into one topic or one field, and you just kind of put up these walls, you're 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 kind of not looking at the whole picture. You, know, you have to draw from all these different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, <laughs> a holistic approach to bring in new ideas, share ideas out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, never stop learning. Yes, yeah, exactly. One of our kapana, our captains, and a great mentor, um, teacher, Kumu, to us in Polynesian Voyaging Society, Uncle Bruce Blankenfield, his, you know, favorite 
his favorite value concept principle that he shares and then encourages us to always um, aspire to be is ime, uh, ime ike. Ike, and it means to always have that hunger to seek knowledge to go out um, to learn to be a lifelong learner and you know I I see that like even while I was reading braiding sweet grass by Robin Wall Kimmerer it's just I see myself as someone because of where I am living in this contemporary world with this indigenous ancestral background, it's we dance in between these worlds of ancestral knowledge and indigenous wisdom, and then we live in a very modern time where we are we are um, exposed and have the ability to use all the technologies um, that we're privileged with, and so I think it's always kind of walking this fine line and incorporating practices from both worlds. Um, Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Mahina. It's one of the one of my great privileges to work uh, work mm -hmm. a lot with Purple Maya Foundation yeah. in in, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, across the Hawaiian community, and in collaboration with Polynesian Voyaging Society, and in collaboration with with Nautilus and Ocean mm -hmm. Exploration Trust, and so many Hawaiian young people being inviting them into this conversation of exactly that. How mm -hmm. do we? How do we walk in the space, live in the space, dance in the space, <laughs> struggle in the space of, of uh, our ancestors and the ancestral way and, and the future mm -hmm. and hold that tension so that uh, so it can be a continuous thread and that we can leverage contemporary technologies but for Hawaiian purposes, for yes. indigenous values and mm -hmm. the advancement of community, the advancement of ohana, the advancement of aloha. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, keep, keeping that at the center of yeah. it all. Yeah, it's uh, and and we see it. There's so many scientific colleagues, uh, tech, technology developers who are, um, who also felt this same desire. Maybe didn't always know how to articulate it, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, but are are really coming alongside as allies to support. And we're learning so much and uh, seeing a whole new uh, ecosystem, a literal ecosystem. A lot of people use that word as a metaphor, but. Uh, the Hawaii to Hawaiians, it's our businesses are part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Our government is part of the ecosystem. Everything is tied to the aina mm -hmm. and our relationship to nature and um, like so many indigenous communities. And so we see this whole ecosystem of, of uh, businesses and technologies that are that are uh, just seeds at the moment in Hawaii, but uh, I think seeds that will turn into forests and and, yeah. and uh, will be uh, will be beautiful to see. Um, beautiful to see for sure is and it's a joy and a privilege to uh, to even just get to observe it and live in a time when we're we're seeing this uh, this joining together. Uh, mm -hmm. I think part of what we're celebrating on these dives, on these uh, historic shipwrecks, is exactly that. And in a world that was uh, separated through conflict and, and and torn apart from nature in too many ways, um, we see a coming back together again and, and a re a remembering remembering yes. ourselves to community with one another so that yeah, yeah. figuratively yeah. and awesome. literally that's mm -hmm. right it's awesome it does feel that way um especially with you know how you mentioned how our island of maui back at home um, they had their paddle out and I love that because it just speaks to our, our culture back in the islands. Um, but when we unite together, we grieve together, we feel together, we connect with one another, it really brings um, enormous healing. And I mean that can even be said about today, about Patriots Day, about um, September 11th, how you know I'm sure that there are different ceremonies around the nation people are gathering and remembering and connecting and when we do that we lift up those stories those lo those souls uh the legacy lives on and we breathe new life into it absolutely We just hit 1,500 meters and rising. As Mahina mentioned, uh, breathing new life. Uh, ha, breath, the sacred breath is a foundational concept in Hawaiian culture. And, um, and uh, we have 
we have a vision at, at Purple Maya Foundation where I work, which we call Eajo, which is uh, this idea that we're, we're bringing a, a fresh, new breath, new life um, to the islands through this uh, kinds of collaboration, through this shared vision of hope and and uh, abundance created on on behalf of and with and for entire community and everybody involved. And one of the things I love about our time on board the Nautilus is just how diverse and how inclusive the environment is. Uh, really, Ocean Exploration Trust, their leadership, um, Allison Fundus, Megan Cook, the whole team, um, just really uh, doing, taking tremendous strides and and. Uh, and just honoring the value that comes from all different viewpoints, all different walks of life, all different perspectives. And we really, um, I think we all really benefit from that. And and uh, I certainly have enjoyed the learning that comes from that. Mm -hmm. Me too. I always love it when I get to talk to, uh, talk to a colleague or a friend and they say something that makes me completely just challenge some of my own paradigms try to think about things from different angles and that's what that diversity can help bring absolutely you know, it's just a richness that comes from having all of these different backgrounds and life experiences and ways of walking this world We have uh, a beautiful question, a beautiful question coming in from a viewer about the brother of Tutu Pele. I don't know if uh, Kokui uh, knows any special mo'olelo uh, about Kamoho uh, Ali'i, our uh, the shark god, the shark deity, brother of, of Pele, significant to voyagers and navigators, the original navigator who uh, who brought the ancestors here to Hawaii and. There's an island, a moku, mokupuni, that's uh, an atoll named uh, named after this uh, incredible deity and navigator. Uh, Kukui, any any uh, any specific mo'olelo or, or knowledge or maybe reasons why that uh, moku, that mokupuni, might have been given given that name? Oh, mahalo nui na. Actually, I did not know um, of that mole or that, that atoll called um, Kamuhuali'i, but we, yeah, we do believe he was um, one of the first navigators who came to Hawaii, guiding his sister Pele over here. Um, and we also do believe that he also resides um, near Mukupuni called Koho'olawe, um, originally named Konaloa. 
and we believe that he resides in um, in a valley, in a, I think it's a valley, um, but it's like it's a cliff um, called Kanapo Bay. Mm. And you hear all these amazing stories of um, people who are not necessarily, we're saying, close to Ko'olawe. Ko'olawe is a reserve and they have a two mile um, boundary, but um, people do um, go off um, out of that boundary, um, whether it's boating or fishing, paddling. And sometimes they see this, this huge mono, the shark, that we still believe is Kamoholi who resides in that area. And um, I think legend has it that a lot of times when you find a shark with all these fish hooks um, on its jaw, they believe that that's Kamuholi. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Been trying to catch him for a long time, but uh, no can, <laughs> huh? No oh, can. I know that the waters uh, surrounding the Mokupuni and Papahanaumokuake are, are, are known as Maro Reef which is a massive, uh, massive, extensive shallow water reef ecosystem that is uh, so famous for the number of sharks. And Nuhi, the big tiger sharks too, that love to hang out in the shallow waters and uh, maybe get some snacks on young seabirds <laughs> and, uh, and uh, some of the amazing uh, large fish, bountiful fish there. So I wonder, not sure, but I wonder if in naming the islands in the monument, uh, the abundance of sharks and we're not that far from there we're a little bit beyond there um in uh in our own expedition here but uh, mm -hmm. i really appreciate the question and uh, it's it's sparked a bunch of curiosity for me so and thank you for sharing that mo'olelo about ko'olawe as well mm -hmm. and and uh, we love our our legendary sharks um for many hawaiian families uh, their their amokua when their kopuna pass on um they can take on the form of mano Hi. Um, and uh, and have deep relationships, deep pilina with uh, with sharks. Well, many many folks around the world are a bit terrified, and we have reason to to fear them also because of they are amazing predators and and definitely far more at home in the ocean than us. But also, if we enter that place with respect and humility and aloha and knowing that that's that's where the sharks belong, it's it's remarkable to see these creatures. It's such a gift to have them in our oceans and, and I hope their population not only thrives in Papahanaumokuakea but mm -hmm. uh, continues to thrive and, and, and it's thriving grows in, in the main Hawaiian islands. Eo. Eo no mahalo. And speaking of, on sharks, there's, uh, there's like you said, they're omakua and there's this one chant um, that I learned that I got the opportunity to learn a little bit about um, called Nakua Mano Ikayakanaloa. It talks about all of these these deities who take form of these sharks. Mm. And a lot of times, family who associate um, their omakua with Mano or being of the shark deity, they have lineal connections to these particular Akua who are Mano. And so, mm -hmm. and uh, so we each got to learn a little verse. Um, it's a it's, it's a pretty long chant. Um, but one of my verses, um, I forget, there's like three Akua names for each verse. And so um, some of the names that were in my verse was Lua Ehu and also Kanako Kai. Mm. And so just learning about how a lot of these families with these lineal connections to these sharks, each I kind of identify with these Akua, these Nakua Mano Ikayakanaloa, these these sh um, shark gods of, of Kanaloa who still reside in these waters. Yeah, Eula Kanaloa. Awesome to uh, awesome to have uh, this relationship, you know, that uh, Hawaiians and many other indigenous communities, people of the Pacific, certainly have, um, where just cherish the power um, and the importance and significance of all life forms in the ocean. And we're so tuned in to... Uh, the role that they played in their ecosystems and uh, the the ways that they could guide them, we know as as, as voyagers that we we look to you know other life forms. Uh, I love Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, terminology. She often refers to them as more than human, <laughs> or more than human family uh, that can uh, that can guide us um, and show us the way. And I I myself uh, studied biomimicry, study and practice biomimicry, uh, innovation inspired by nature and and humans have so much to learn if we uh, can just 
slow down our minds and our cleverness a little bit mm -hmm. enough to uh, to really witness and observe the genius in nature around us and mm -hmm. it can teach us uh, even incredible things about new technologies uh, new solutions to challenges presented by climate change or um, other issues even have an incredible teacher Toby Herzlick, I, I don't know if Toby's listening in, but mm -hmm. uh, she founded Biomimicry for Social Innovation. So even using the lessons from nature to, to help us reimagine our relationships to one another and our, our social structures and uh, just incredibly creative and innovative folks who are drawing on the wisdom and, and genius of nature. And um, I appreciate that the, our indigenous and communities and native Hawaiians for sure, uh, almost feel, feel silly to call it biomimicry, just call it being Hawaiian, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, so one thing I've learned from uh, talking to Malia and uh, uh, is that saying the name of something uh, gives it mana. Powerful, right? yeah. Yeah, powerful. and um, that, that makes me think a lot about the uh, recent uh, change in name to one of Hawaii's youngest uh, seamounts. Mm -hmm. We used to call it Loihi. Now mm -hmm. it's known as Kamaehua Kanaloa. And I've got the uh, USGS article up about the, na uh, the, the name change. And what it says here is that Kamaehua Kanaloa's previous name was descriptive, but failed to reflect Hawaiian cultural knowledge. Several mele, orally passed down and documented in writing decades before the 1954 expedition, which uh, would have mm -hmm. characterized uh, Luihi, uh, now known as Kamaehua Kanaloa. It's described uh, Kamaehua Kanaloa as an undersea volcano. It's explained by Kuule Kanahele of the Edith uh, Kanakaole Foundation. Mm -hmm. Kamaehua Kanaloa, quote, is a powerful name that invokes the name of Pele Honuamea and her birth out of Kanaloa. End quote. The new name was an unanimously adopted in July 2021 by the wow. Hawaii Board on Geographic Names. Wow. So they, they were looking for something that was much more symbolic and much more fitting of that volcano <laughs> and the oral histories around it, mm -hmm. trying to give it more power than what uh, its uh, uh, previous name conveyed. Lo'ihi. It's a good nickname, though. Yeah. Sometimes people just call me Lo'ihi. Oh, really? Yeah. Lo'ihi. It's just tall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not as tall as uh, undersea volcano, but almost. Yeah, but I, l I love that name because it brings in those elements of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With it. it Kamae Huo well. Yeah, yeah mahalo, mahalo for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, it is through you know when we reclaim those spaces um, through indigenous language, through language in general. We do give mana back to it. We do give power back to it. Um, and I think that's seen all over the world. I know when I was speaking to some of the Alaska natives, a part of the Haida Nation up in Southeast Alaska this past summer, we had the privilege of voyaging there on Hokulea and hearing them just talk about their own islands. Um, you know, we were talking to one of the tribal leaders and they are fighting to change the name um, to find a more fitting name, like you said, for the Prince of Wales Island mm. in South.